Let's see, explain the philosophy of Leibniz. Monadology from 1714. So first to put this work into context, it actually has a different full title as well. He called it the Principles of Philosophy, just like Descartes also had a work called the Principles of Philosophy, but he also called it the Monadology. Uh, and this is definitely one of Leibniz's most well-known works and one of the latest in his life. He ends up dying in 1716, so it's coming out just two years before he ends up dying. Um, and instead of being a more of like an introductory work, which you might think based on the name that it's the principles and that it's so well known, it's actually very much so meant to be like a condensed summary, uh, almost like an appendix of all of his works, really working to sum up his entire working metaphysical theory. So let's move into his PSR, his Principle of Sufficient Reason here in the Monodology. And again, so far, the best refresher we've had going all the way back to 1686, 28 years earlier at this point from his essay called On Contingency. Leibniz says that nothing exists without there being a greater reason for it to exist than for it not to exist. But here in Monodology, if we look at the 31st and 32nd Principles, we're actually going to get a very clear, laid-out explanation of what this PSR, what this Principle of Sufficient Reason is. So Leibniz says, starting in the 31st Principle, that our reasonings are based on two great principles, that of contradiction, in virtue of which we judge that which involves a contradiction to be false, and that which is opposed or contradictory to the false to be true. Right, And this kind of gets in the philosophy of science a little bit. It's conjecture and refutation, made famous, made famous by Karl Popper. So essentially, if you can contradict something and show that it's false, then the opposite of that is thought to be true, right? Just a basic true-false principle. It's the principle of contradiction. Then he goes on into the 32nd principle. Leibniz says, and that of sufficient reason, by virtue of which we consider that we can find no true or existent fact, no true assertion, that there being a sufficient reason why it is thus and not otherwise. Although most of the time these reasons cannot be known to us. So let's actually move into the best possible world to break that down and actually apply it. So let's look at his BPW argument in the monadology. So again, just bringing back a refresher from last time, going back to his essay on the ultimate origination of things, 17 years early at this point, Leibniz is arguing that this world is physically, metaphysically, and morally perfect because it is the will of the best and most perfect God to be so. So let's take what he just said in the 32nd principle of the monadology. Let's combine it with what he said 17 years early on the ultimate origination of things, and let's look at really how he's using the PSR to inform his BPW theory. So essentially, we're now lining this up t in tandem, right? It is the best possible world because of the principle of sufficient reason. So why? Well, it is the best possible, the best of all possible worlds because either there is no otherwise world, right? And this is coming from what he laid forth in principle 32 of the monodology. And or, right, you could take this in two parts or just in one, we cannot know if it isn't the best possible world, right? There's no way to contradict or refute this. There's no alternative that we can know of because we're living in this one. So he seems to kind of have his beat there in a bit of a, a fuzzy logic trap. Um, that's how we get that this is the best possible world from his principle of sufficient reason here in his summary work of his monadology. But most importantly, let's look at how Leibniz really defines what monads are in the monadology. And I kind of went through his preface where he used his theory of monads as an argument against Lockean materialism and Locke is largely following the materialism of the time he's not disembarking that far from the earlier ration la rationalists like Descartes but to sum up and paraphrase what Leibniz has already said that monads are matter uh, they're the mixture of the effects of the surrounding infinity they're divisible fluid and harmonious but they're also rigid, bodily, hard, and they have mass, right? So we kind of see a spectrum of what monads, monads can be. But now here in the monadology, there's a lot going on. You really just have to read it. It spans over a, a number of pages, regardless of your translation and which edition you have. But I took some, some key snippets um, from some of the first few principles really from the first 30 principles or so of how Leibniz is clarifying his concept of monads. So monads are to Leibniz, they are simple substances. They're the true atoms of nature and they're the elements of things. They can only begin by creation and end by annihilation. And this also implies through the will of God, right? They're either the best part of the best possible world or they are not. And that is all determined by the will of God. 
Monads are neither substance nor accident can enter them. Or sorry, they are simple substances for which neither other substances nor accidents can enter into them. Uh, they must be different from each other. Before monads, their change is continual, and they change from an internal principle. Again, think Cavendishian here a bit. And also to get into Cavendish and how there's uh, aspects of rational knowledge and perception in all things, Leibniz, Leibniz agrees. He says that monads have at least the qualities of perception and appetite inherently in them. So this gives you uh, maybe a bit of a clearer picture of what the monads are for Leibniz. Again, still a very complex concept, even at the end of his life in his monadology in 1714, he was struggling to really communicate a clear idea of what this was for him, metaphysically speaking, and how it made up his material worldview. But for now, I hope that helps.